So maybe I can just start explaining the topic because uh, upside it says bandwidth matters, <laughs> but the topic is actually bandwidth doesn't matter. <laughs> so uh, there seems to be some quality assurance lacking in the, <laughs> the organization somewhere. <laughs> Uh, so the theme is why doesn't bandwidth matter anymore uh, when it used to, basically. Uh, and my name is Ragnar Lam, and that's a Swedish name. I'm from Sweden, uh, and I come from Load Impact, which is a company founded in Sweden. Um, and basically, uh, very short about us. What is Load Impact? Uh, we are a software as a service product, uh, an online solution, and we do load testing. So we load test websites and applications. We generate artificial traffic across the internet and we see how much traffic an application can handle before it becomes too slow or inaccessible. And we launched in 2009 and have done very well. We've become a very, very popular service with over 100,000 users and over a million load tests. And we're recruiting, so if there are any good uh, front or back end developers, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Um, so, basically, what, what's the problem with bandwidth? Uh, this is uh, the result of some research done by Google uh, that shows how, this is PLT it says, it's page load time. How long does it take to load a full web page? And they used the standard web page and they experimented with different amounts of bandwidth available to the browser client to see how fast the page loaded. And they saw that if they gave the client one megabit of bandwidth, it took like three seconds to load the page. And then, of course, if they gave the client two megabits, then it substantially reduced load time to two seconds. But then they saw that each megabit they added uh, made for a, a smaller and smaller reduction in page load time. And if you look, for example, at 5 megabits compared to 10, if you double the amount of bandwidth, you get like a 15% or something increase, uh, decrease in load time. So there's a cl clearly a, a case of diminishing returns when you add more bandwidth. And today many people have multi-megabit bandwidth at home. So there's really not much use for more bandwidth. And this is something that many don't realize. And internet service providers are still selling on bandwidth. They're saying you can get more bandwidth, buy more bandwidth. Uh, they're trying to upsell bandwidth. While in reality, maybe that's not what is needed. Um, so why is it this way? Well, if you look back a little bit, uh, some history. HTTP is an old protocol. It was uh, first specified or standardized in 1996 version 1.0. Uh, and back then, uh, web pages were very different from what they're like today. They were really small. And also, people were, were using dial-up modems. And they, they had very, very little bandwidth. So bandwidth was an issue. Um, something else that, that was happening, uh, or other things that uh, characterized this period, was that uh, lots of stuff were being standardized, but people were in a hurry to implement things. So when the implementation was set, people had all, or when the standard was set, people had already implemented parts of it while it was being drafted. And that was also true for HTTP 1.0, because as soon as HTTP 1.0 was specified, uh, they had already started working on 1.1, and people were already starting to implement live features of 1.1. So it was kind of a mess, and people were in a big hurry. It was the dot-com boom. And in 97 already, 1.1 was specified, so not much time between 1.0 and 1.1. And like I said, a lot of things had already been implemented. 1.1 um, included some performance optimizations, like HTTP pipelining, connection reuse, uh, better caching, and uh, HTTP range requests. And these were, uh, they were optimizing performance, but uh, they didn't maybe uh, we, we're still using this protocol today, and these uh, optimizations were maybe not enough for, for the situation we have today. So just uh, getting down to the basics a little bit, probably most of you know all this already, but it doesn't, 
it, it's, it's really important to understand how it, things work at the low level so you can understand how the HTTP protocol suffers for when it encounters either low bandwidth or low uh, high network delay. So if we have uh, something that needs to be transferred between uh, from, a, from a server to a client, like an image file, then that file contains a lot of data. The data gets uh, chopped up into small pieces that are sent individually as data packets over the internet. This is a packet switched network. And one thing that is, one analogy that's quite good to use is that of a water pipe. Uh, if you want to, if you want to transfer water from water from A to B, uh, and you have you have a bucket of water and you pour it into a pipe in one end, and then it comes out the other end, and let's say it takes five seconds for the water to, to flow through the pipe, those five seconds is the network delay, the delay through the pipe. If you have more water and you try to pour it into the pipe too fast, then it won't work. The pipe is too narrow. Uh, and this is a bandwidth problem. We don't have enough bandwidth. But the water that, that does flow through the pipe still takes five seconds to come out the other end. That's this, the delay isn't affected. The bandwidth of the pipe is too small. Uh, so we increase the, 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 the diameter of the pipe, a bigger pipe, and now we can pour water th through at a high rate. But it's still not fast in a delay sense. The delay is still five seconds. It takes five seconds for the water to flow, uh, th flow through the pipe. So bandwidth and delay are two different things. And uh, it's really important to understand the difference. So in, in the network case, a data packet that gets transmitted from here to here would take five seconds to arrive. And the di diameter of the pipe just uh, tells us how many data packets per second can we send through through the pipe without overflow. So how does delay affect HTTP? Well, in several ways. Uh, first of all, HTTP runs on top of a protocol <coughs> called TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, and TCP uh, wants to perform a handshake and set up a connection to be able to transfer data. So when a client wants to fetch something from a server, like an image file, uh, it needs to first set up a TCP connection to the server. And <coughs> it happens like this. The client sends out something called a synchronization message, which is a TCP message from the client to the server. And this is, by the way, this is at time zero. And here you can see my, my fantastical uh, animation skills, because these are individual slides. <laughs> <laughs> so the packet goes from the, from the client. Don't hire me as a designer uh, or a graphics artist. Um, the packet goes from the client to the server. Boom. And then it arrives at the server, and let's say it took 200 milliseconds. And that's a fairly long one-way delay, but it can happen if, if the server and client are uh, wide apart geographically. If like, if like if the server is in Australia and we try to load stuff from here, we might get 200 milliseconds uh, one way. So after 200 milliseconds, the server has the, the synchronization package that tells it that the client wants to open a TCP connection. So now the server has to send back uh, an acknowledgement that it got this synchronization message and its own synchronization message also. Da -da 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 -dum. 400 milliseconds. And now the client considers the TCP connection to be uh, open. Um, but it still has to send, uh, send an acknowledgement back to the server because the server sends its, its synchronization message. So. The client sends back an acknowledgement, but it can also start actually sending an HTTP request now because the, H the, the TCP connection is open. So it adds a TCP connection, uh, sorry, an HTTP request also. And this travel back to the server. And after 600 milliseconds, the server actually has an HTTP request. The client wants me to give it something, uh, this image.jpg file. Uh, and now, of course, the server has to think a little bit, maybe retrieve the file from disk before sending it back and so on. But let's say it's in infinitely fast and it happens immediately. So the server sends back the response. And this is a bit more data because it's the file data that is being sent. And it arrives at, on the client side. And you know, provided we have infinite bandwidth, it takes a total of 800 milliseconds until the client has the, 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 the response. And this is actually the minimum time possible. 
Now, if we have limited bandwidth, it will take longer, of course, and it will, might take time to actually uh, load the data, also transfer the data, because data will be queued up on the server side. Uh, but 800 milliseconds is quite quite a bit of time in, in these uh, uh, circumstances. So if we look at a, a typical web page in 96, <coughs> it was very simple. It consisted of an HTML file. This is a little bit blurry, but it says index.html here. And four image files. Image 1, 2, 3, 4, dot gif. Because gif was being widely used. Um, and this is, by the way, just a, uh, an imagined page load. It's just to illustrate the concept. So what we saw in 1996, if we loaded a web page, was that a browser would connect one single TCP connection. And the blue part here is the time it takes to set up the TCP connection to do the TCP handshake. And then the red part is when the client issues the GET request and uh, waits for the data to start coming back from the server. And the data starts coming back here. And then the green bar is the download time, the time it takes to transfer all the data. And this is dependent on bandwidth, basically. Uh, if we have very little bandwidth, like most people did in 96 with dial-up modems that could transfer maybe five kilobytes per second, uh, then it could take quite a while to download things. So here we see that the, the connection setup takes maybe half a second, and then we have to wait half a second for the HTTP request to go back uh, to go to the server and the reply to start coming back, and then it takes maybe one more one second to download all the data also in the HTML file case. The images, of course, are a bit more uh, data heavy, so the download time is much greater here. And what we see also is that the browser sets up two parallel TCP connections. First, it downloads the HTML file, it parses it, it gets to know about all the other resources it, it needs to render the page. And then it opens two more connections and downloads two things in parallel to speed things up. Uh, when it's done with that, it tears down the connections and it uh, starts to uh, establishes two new connections and downloads uh, two more things. And this is the way uh, browsers worked in 96. They were allowed to use a maximum of two concurrent connections to download things, so as not to overload servers and, and so on. Now, what's happened since 96 is that web pages have gotten a lot more complex. So this is just a graph showing what's happened the last two years. We've gone from about 80 objects on an average web page to, to, to about 100 and from uh, 1,100 kilobytes to 1,900. So, I mean, and this development has been going on for the last 18 years. So in, in 96, like, like I showed earlier, it, it was maybe, it was a handful of objects, five maybe. And the, the, the page weight was maybe, I don't know, 50 kilobytes, 100 maybe. Uh, so things have changed a lot in, in the terms of how complex web pages are today. And if we look at, what uh, a page load today looks like. It's more something like this. Now, here I have only 26 resources, actually, because putting 100 resources here would just make it too messy. So I had to do with 26. But uh, it illustrates what's happening. So today, we have lots more, lots more stuff to load. Um, but we also have a lot higher bandwidth. We, people have much faster, in, faster, much more high capacity internet connections today. So what we see is that uh, the green part here, the download time, is quite short uh, because things download very quickly. And actually, this is exaggerating it a little bit. Uh, that sometimes the download time, when you do one of these flow, uh, water, waterfall diagrams, you can sometimes not even see the download time because it's so short. So the majority of the time we spend today is waiting for connect, uh, TCP connections and for, for uh, for the HTTP requests to go back and forth. So it, and that's, of course, dependent on delay, network delay. So here we see a client connecting, uh, uh, downloading the index HTML, opening two, uh, closing that connection, opening two new <coughs> connections, and downloading a couple of a style sheet and the JavaScript, <coughs> and then two more JavaScripts here, and then lots of images, images, images. And it finishes after like 3.8 seconds. While if we look at this one, was like 10 seconds something for much fewer objects. So things are faster, but there's also so much more to download. 
Uh, now, if we look at the optimizations made by HTTP 1.1, we have something called connection reuse, uh, which means that connections are not thrown away, they are reused. Uh, so here we, we download connect and download index HTML. Uh, we reuse that connection to download the stylesheet file. And we also open a second connection and download the Java first JavaScript here. And then after that we have two connections active. So we reuse those connections throughout the whole page flow. And we finish at 2.7 or something instead of 3.8. So it's quite a big performance benefit to not having to you know, throw away and re-establish new TCP connections all the time. Um, and then of course, uh, <laughs> What happened was that browser makers realized that using more connections would speed things up even further. Uh, the, 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 the standard said to use max two connections, but if we use more, it will be faster, so why not? So they started uh, ignoring the standard and used three, four, six, eight connections per host name. And of course, it, 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 yeah, it, it resulted in huge uh, speed up. So here can we see what happens when we use four connections. Uh, and have connection reuse. So then uh, we download index HTML and we reuse that connection and then we start three new connections and then we have four connections active all the time. And we finish at like 1.5 seconds instead of 2.7. So a huge performance benefit. There are uh, however drawbacks to using many connections uh, on the client side, which we'll see later. But and then there's pipelining, uh, another performance optimization of HTTP 1.1. And uh, maybe I forgot to say, but HTTP 1.1 is actually the, the version we're using today. It has been updated a little bit and, and uh, better standardized, but it's still the same basic version uh, that was uh, first um, published in 97. <coughs> so with pipelining, uh, what happens is uh, the, the, the client can say, I want uh, image 1, image 2, image 3, image 4, image 5. Uh, and it doesn't have to wait for the server to send it each image. So it just says, I want these five images. And the server says, 200, OK, here's image 1, and sends image 1 data. And then it says, 200, OK, here's image 2. So the client can just uh, line up a lot of requests which means it doesn't have to go back and forth and wait for the network <coughs> delay all the time. And that saves a lot of time also. So here, here we load index HTML, we reuse the connection. And by the way, uh, after loading index HTML, the client, when parsing index HTML, it, it knows about all the resources it needs to download. So I forgot to mention that. So after it has downloaded index HTML and parsed it, it knows about all the images and the JavaScript and style sheets and everything it needs to load. That's the assumption here. Uh, so this means that once it's done there, it can issue requests for all the remaining objects here. So what happens is it opens three new connections and keeps the old one. It issues requests for all the remaining objects here. And then it just sits, ba sits back and, and receives stuff from the server. And the server just pushes things as fast as it can to the client. And we're done after one second instead of one and a half. So pipelining, in theory, uh, is great for performance. And it reduces, it eliminates a lot of you know, back and forth between client and server uh, uh, chat iterations. But pipelining has problems. There's one <coughs> thing called head of line blocking. When a client has said, I want image one, two, three, four, five, it can't change that order. It can't do anything about it. The server has to deliver those things in order, and uh, the client can't interrupt what's happening. Which means that if it's asked for this object, uh, and this, and this, and this, but then after a while it realizes that I need, really need this object now. Maybe, maybe this guy took a long time to download or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, and the client realizes, I really need this now to serve my user. And then it can't do anything has to wait for this guy to download. It takes forever. And, and the, the application is stuck. Where, and this meant that it was really, really tricky to program uh, applications, to make applications that worked well um, uh, when you had this issue. And uh, people basically didn't implement pipelining. Some implemented it, and they did it poorly. So there was also compatibility issues. 
And the end result was that people kind of stopped using pipelining. They switched it off. And today, almost no browsers uh, even support it. And those who do support it have it off, usually switched off by default. So you have to switch it on manually if you want to use it. So it's basically a dead feature, and the community ha have given up on it. Um, so here's another graph from Google showing page load time as a function of network delay. So here's the page load time, starts at four seconds. And then we have the network delay between uh, the server and the client. So here's zero milliseconds, and here's 240. You can see there's a linear relationship or, or a linear improvement here when you inc uh, de decrease the, the network delay. So this means that it's always it's always efficient. It's always u good to, to 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 decrease network delay. That always results in improving for performance. Uh, but the same cannot be said for increasing bandwidth anymore. Um, so the web community has tried to optimize. Um, uh, web pages to reduce their their sensitivity to network delay and make them faster. And uh, there's lots of different techniques. There's one called spriting, where you take lots of small images that you use on a web page and you concatenate them into one big image. And this, of course, means that instead of like 50 single requests for different small images, you get just one HTTP request for a large image. And what happens then on the client side is you, you use parts of this image in, in different uh, places on your page. Um, we also have inlining, where you uh, actually put data inside the, uh, inside the CSS uh, file, for instance. Um, you put image data in there to, again, reduce the number of requests. Instead of having to ask for the images, they are contained in another file. And then we have uh, concatenation is, is uh, concatenating JavaScript into one single JavaScript. So you take many scripts and make one script out of them. So all those three are basically meant to reduce the number of requests made. And then we have sharding, which is my uh, hate uh, object, number one, I think. Uh, and that's uh, where you, uh, you put your content on several different hosts uh, in order to get around this limit, how many TCP connections a client is using uh, is, is uh, determined per host name. <coughs> so, uh, for example, um, a modern version of Firefox might use six connections per host name. So, if you have three host names that they, that like things are fetched from on your web page, then you can get up to 24 connections. Uh, sorry, my math is not good. 18 connections uh, from from a Firefox client. So a total of 18 connections being used, of course, speeds up the, the, the download time or the, the rendering time of the page. Um, yeah, no, so why, why is many connections bad? Uh, TCP wasn't really designed for, for this kind of usage. So what happens is when you have many connections is, first of all, you put more strain on the servers because the servers have to keep a lot of state for each connection. And there's like network buffers and so on. You you waste a lot of memory and r server resources by using lots of connections. Uh, so that's that's bad. Also, you waste network bandwidth actually because there's an overhead for each uh, TCP connection, <coughs> e even if it's small. Uh, and then you have the problem with TCP always tries to allocate bandwidth fairly uh, over a, a link or a connection. Which means that if you, for example, if you're on your home internet <coughs> connection and you have, uh, say, you have an FTP file transfer going on uh, and you start uh, Firefox or something and you download, uh, you open a web page that, that uses 18 concurrent connections, that means that uh, Firefox will, will consume 18 times more bandwidth than your FTP connection. So basically, Firefox will steal all the available bandwidth, and your FTP uh, transfer will get very, very little. And this can, of course, be a problem because the whole idea with TCP is to to allow it is to share bandwidth equally among applications. And the the original thought was that one application uses one connection. So when applications start using multiple connections, that whole thing gets screwed up a little bit. Um, 
some in some cases I have to say it's it's uh, warranted because like with peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing like BitTorrent they have to use lots of connections but they also often have limit limitations you can set the maximum uh, allowed bandwidth that they use so are we screwed uh, do we have to develop web pages in this way with these ugly optimizations um, Oh, yeah, I should also mention that you probably get this already, but spiting inline and concatenation is bad because it complicates web development. Uh, instead of being able to just update one single image uh, in, in the spriting case, uh, you have to update a large image. It also reduces caching efficiency because a caching system has to invalidate the whole cache rather than just a small part of it. When so something little changes, so are we doomed to to use these uh, I think ugly workarounds in, in web development? Um, if we had something else, a, a new protocol that was less sensitive to network delay, we wouldn't have to do all these things. Uh, it would also be nice if if we didn't get uh, the pipelining head of line blocking problem, but could somehow do pipelining anyway. Uh, and uh, if it didn't encourage browser vendors and others to use many, many TCP connections, which is wasteful. And also it should be, of course, backwards compatible. So HTTP2 is maybe that protocol. Uh, and this is what our page load would look like with HTTP2. So we download index.html and then we know about all the other objects we need to download and then we just ask for all of them at once and we download all of them concurrently and we do this using one single TCP connection rather than multiple and we see the speed is quite good also it's faster than uh, any other uh, any of the other examples so HTTP2 does this using multiplexing which are true multiplexing which means that if you have two different things you want to download, like these two toy trains, then <laughs> um, this is what happens. They get uh, combined into a larger <laughs> toy train. That's not what happens in reality, but you, you, the pieces of the data get interleaved and sent at the same time, basically. So, so everything gets sent at once and everything arrives at once. So this means that you push a ton of data through at the same time, which means you can use one single TCP connection because there's just one basically request being made. And you can um, send everything at the same time, which means you will fill your bandwidth, you would use up all your network capacity to, to transfer data. It's very, very efficient. Um, yeah. So, more about HTTP2. It's a oh, it's a binary. Sorry. <laughs> it's a binary protocol, which is something people don't really like uh, so much because people are used to being able to debug internet protocols just by you know, connecting to them and talking to them uh, using a command prompt. Uh, but it's binary because it makes it more efficient and more uh, less implementations will probably work better. We've had lots of problems with old, old style HTTP because, um, uh, like, uh, uh, um, line line feeds and stuff. Where where does a part of the data end and another part begin? There's been lots of uh, troubles trying to figure out exactly where different parts of the data begin and end in a text-based protocol like HTTP. <coughs> Uh, so making it binary makes it much more clear. There is no discussion. Uh, you have a set number of bits for some data item, and then the next one starts. Um, it works. It ha it works by uh, using the upgrade header, which means that uh, it can start as HTTP one or HTTP one point one, and then it sends uh, an upgrade header saying the client can send an upgrade header and saying I want to upgrade to HTTP two. Uh, and then they switch to HTTP2. It's basically how web sockets work also. Uh, and uh, it favors encryption. So 
it will probably mostly be binary and encrypted, which means it's really, really hard to debug unless you have special tools. And even then it can be difficult, but that's a compromise that's been made to make it more efficient and more secure. And uh, if, you, if you use TLS, the uh, negotiation to use HTTP2 can actually happen during the TLS handshake. So uh, there is not much time lost to sending, for sending up grade headers and stuff. And multiplexing is done with something called streams. So in HTTP2 you have an unlimited number of streams that are each uh, one transfer. And it's really nice because you can prioritize streams. You can say this one is more important than that one. I'm more interested in this item than that one. Or you can say that this is dependent on that. I want this first and then that. Uh, and you can also cancel a transfer at any time. So the client can, in the middle of a transfer, the client can say, reset this stream. I don't want it anymore. And uh, there's no penalty for that. While in HTTP 1, you could only like drop the TCP connection, which is a very <coughs> ugly way of doing it, and causing problems for the server, probably. So, yeah, so it's so much more flexible. It remains to be seen what the client and server vendors will do to actually make this, uh, yeah, to, to, to use these features well. But it's very, very powerful. Um, so, header compression is on by default, which is also a big gain because HTTP headers are quite large today. There's lots of stuff being sent in cookies uh, in every single request, no matter how small the request is. And uh, that's a big, big waste. Uh, so header compression is, is default. Um, and also there's server push. So basically a client can say, I accept server push. And then the server can opportunistically send stuff to the client. And, and like the client might want this soon, so I'll send it now. So it, the client has it in the future if they need it. And that's, of course, something also that can really increase performance of an application if, if it is used in a smart way. So HTTP uh, is actually going to be proposed to the IETF as a standard in December now. So it's very, very close. Uh, and uh, HTTP 2. <laughs> and and uh, there's lots of clients and servers that have support for it. Uh, most of them require you to like compile the client or the server and enable it. But uh, Firefox, for instance, uh, has it built in already. So it's, uh, it's supported by all the large server and client vendors, and that's something I think can actually make it succeed. And also it, because it's backwards compatible. So in a little while we might have a huge user base that all support HTTP2. And then suddenly it becomes interesting for new, new projects to start thinking about should we just go HTTP2 when we develop our new application. So in the short term, I think it won't affect things much because you will still have to support HTTP 1.1 and 2 and then it's easier to just write your application for HTTP 1.1. Do all the spriting and concatenations and whatever. Uh, but maybe in a year or so, uh, people have upgraded all their browsers and we'll see that 95% of the user base suddenly support HTTP 2. And then I think it might happen that people start just developing for HTTP 2 uh, from, from, the, from the start when they develop new stuff. And that would be really nice to avoid all this spriting and inlining and stuff. I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see. Um, Blag, Blag and Daria. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, if anyone uh, has any questions, uh, just come and talk to me and uh, you can take my card if you're interested in load testing or whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>